Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. You have been emailing me this week, and I have been watching this thing uh, since August. Uh, the, the story, the worldwide story, everybody's eyes were on their, as you say in the, in the UK, on their tellies, uh, watching this thing with the Chilean miners. Several of you have sent, a lot of you have sent me emails on this, and we are going to deal with this on the Watchman video broadcast. We've got a few things I want to get to beforehand, but be sure that you watch this thing so that you can understand what really is going on. Uh, the first thing, several of you sent me this article. Uh, this is from World Net Daily. State snatches baby when dad accused of being an oath keeper. A 16-year-old newborn was snatched from her parents by authorities in Concord, New Hampshire after social service workers alleged the father is a member of Oath Keepers. The organization collects affirmations from soldiers and peace officers that they would refuse orders that violate the U.S. Constitution in light of what they perceive as the advance of socialism in the United States. The father, Jonathan, Jonathan Irish, told World Net Daily that the affidavit signed by Child Protective Service worker Dana Bickford seeking government custody of newborn Cheyenne said the agency, quote, became aware and confirmed that Mr. Irish associated with a militia known as the Oath Keepers. Irish, in an interview with World Net Daily, said officers and other social services workers ordered him to stand with his hands behind his back, frisked him, and then took his daughter from him and his fiance at Concord Hospital where the baby had been born. Now, I want to... I saw this thing, and, and I want to I want to say this. I don't know this man. I don't know if, if there were other mitigating circumstances that led Child Protection Services to take this baby away from them. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know this guy. But I will tell you, if, if Child Protective Services took this man's baby on the majority basis of him being a member of Oath Keepers, we are in trouble in this country. Now let me let me just kind of comment on this a little bit. Number one, uh, the baby has been returned to his mother and father, and we thank God for that. Uh, pray for this family that along with being Oath Keepers, they could be born-again Christians. You pray for them. Pray for their salvation. But this, this troubles me. Oath Keepers, and let me, so that you understand this. A group of, of soldiers, police officers, peacekeepers, who decided that they were going to keep the oath that they, that they swore. They swore that they would protect and defend, just like the president, the, the, not the United States, but the Constitution of the United States. These are soldiers and, and police officers that said we're not accepting any other orders that contradict the Constitution of the United States. I, it, I thought that all soldiers and police officers automatically, by virtue of the oath they took, I thought they were automatically saying that they were going to keep the prop. What, what, what do we want? Do we want police officers and, um, and soldiers out there that will give their loyalty in some other direction? Is that what we want? And apparently, apparently, and, and I suspect the Southern Poverty Law Center or other ilk like this, uh, I suspect that probably they have listed uh, this Oath Keepers um, organization as part of some uh, right-wing militia, dangerous, going to overthrow the government. I suspect that they've, that they've been listed as, as something that is a threat not to the United States of America, not to uh, the Constitution of the United States, but they are a threat to the socialist agenda that is moving. It's, I mean, they live in, uh, where was this, uh, uh, Concord, New Hampshire? Okay, not known for its conservative fundamentalism up in New Hampshire. I'm not saying that some people aren't. I'm just saying they're not known for that. Uh, New England itself is a very liberal, very progressive, seemingly socialist-leaning uh, area of the country. And uh, I, here again, I'm glad that they returned the baby back. And here's, here's what I want to say about that, is that we have a voice. 
we have a voice. Now, had this all been done quietly and no news media had reported on this, like World Net Daily and others out there, um, had this not been reported and made a big deal out of, these people might very well have lost their child solely on the basis of this man saying, hey, I swore an oath and I'm going to keep that oath. What is this? Communist Soviet Union? Um, what are we, China? What are we, North Korea here? This is the United States of America. People have a right to affiliate themselves with organizations that are not a threat to the Constitution and the laws of this country. People have a right to that. And upon, if, if it's true, upon the majority basis of this man's uh, affiliation with Oath Keepers, they pull his child out of his house... Uh, out of their arms. Apparently they were still in the hospital. There's something wrong in America. There is something drastically wrong and if they can take this man's child, yours is not, mine is coming up next. Okay. Uh, what organization are we part of? Bethel Church, Festus, Missouri, broadcasting from a top secret broadcasting bunker, uh, right wing, fundamental, Bible believing Christians. We'll take all of our kids away. Um, Wow. Um, a follow-up. You remember E.T. touching Elliot's head. Uh, this was the, um, the topic of last week's Watchman broadcast, talking about Michelangelo and the pineal gland. And here's E.T. touching uh, Elliot's forehead. And he said, I'll be right here in this, all this imagery. If you have not seen that broadcast, you need to go back and watch that. Uh, this was based upon Michelangelo's um, drawing of God touching Adam's finger, giving him life and illumination and all this stuff. We dealt with that. Uh, and several of you astute watchers sent me uh, several things this week. One of them which was a uh, an advertisement uh, for a financial group called SAS. Notice the SAS logo. You have the two elements uh, combining together. That That is as above, so below. But look at this, uh, the woman here. The caption says, the future of your e-business, which is your electronic business, business over the internet, is being decided right here. Okay, now let's just stop and get this now from the biblical context. Uh, here we have a mark on her forehead, writing on her forehead, uh, where the pineal gland is. And uh, it has to do with commerce, buying and selling, so that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name on their right hand, or excuse me, in their right hand or in in their forehead. And then here uh, we have we, we have a watcher in uh, I think it's Hong Kong. Um, that uh, here's the image here of God touching Adam's uh, finger, giving him illumination, his arm wrapped around his uh, red-headed naked girlfriend, Shekinah. Um, sons of God, daughters of men. Here is a, a, it was apparently an outside billboard uh, on a building in Hong Kong. Notice the imagery here. The same finger point touch. And we have this floating male coming down from the sky angel. Uh, and a woman clothed in scarlet. Hmm. Wow. Sons of God, daughters of men. It's right. I'll tell you, it's it's not just here in America. It's everywhere. Okay. It's a, this is a this is a global conspiracy. All right. It's going to cover the entire the entire globe. Uh, all right. Uh, here, somebody sent me this a couple weeks ago, and I I decided to fit it in here. Snap Scouts. Uh, crowdsourcing crime prevention. See it? Snap it? Send it. Little cartoon character. It just looks so cute there. Uh, basically, this is a, uh, a, a little a program that you can get on your, I think it's Google Android phone or an iPhone, and uh, for kids. Kids walking around with cell phones. Let me get my cell phone here. Kids walking around with cell phones, you know, sending funny jokes to their other kids and stuff like that. And the program here, the, the, the software program, and the program itself is designed so that if a child sees something that it doesn't look right to them, they can take a picture of it or, or a video and they can turn that in to the proper authorities. They're turning, they're turning kids in, in your house into, into little spies. Okay? Spy kids. 
that's what they're turning your kids into spies. And so with I mean with all the with all the child protective services regulations and guidelines and stipulations concerning what they think is appropriate and what they think is not appropriate. I remember in years ago in the state of Missouri we have a program called Parents as Teachers. The Parents as Teachers program was basically about, hey, can, we're government agents. Can, can we come in your house? And there were certain guidelines that parents as teachers were supposed to look at inside of a home to see if maybe that child was at risk. One of them was that if the parent was, was overweight and they were a smoker, that, that child's at risk. We really need it. The, the government really needs to get involved in this situation. And so now these kids, and get this, any kid that doesn't like anything in their house, click. Send it in. The proper authorities get involved. Um, Jesus warned us that in the last days, people would be disobedient to their parents and that children would turn against their own parents. New World Order people, now your own kids are going to turn you in. Uh, here's another one called the safety tat. Okay, the tat that brings kids back, and uh, apparently this is a um, this is a little uh, tattoo, little I think it's a removable tattoo. When you go to you know the amusement park or to the mall or something like that, put the tat on the tot, and it's it's on their really close to their hand here, and it's an identification mark, and it's got your cell phone number on it. So if the child gets lost, they can call mommy. Okay. Well, it sounds like a good idea. It's just, it's just, and we covered this here a few weeks ago in the Watchman broadcast, uh, concerning the environment that we live in now, where everything has to be marked and identified. That is coming right to us right out of Bible prophecy, where everything has to be marked and identified. Here's a story concerning that. Here's another school that's going to start tracking kids with uh, RFID technology. Tracking devices used in school badges. Two districts are first in the area to use ID tags that raise privacy, safety concerns, radio frequency identification. The same technology used to monitor cattle is tracking students in the Spring and Santa Fe school districts. Uh, ID badges for some students in both school districts now include tracking devices that allow campus administrators to keep tabs on students' whereabouts on campus. School Leaders say the devices improve security and increase attendant rates. You see, these things are they're they're good for us. I mean, they're they're for us. They're it. They are in our best interest to let our to have everybody, all of the little sheeple in the little public schools, to be tracked and monitored everywhere. That we're just trying. We're doing this for you. Don't you understand? I mean, this sounds like uh, Barack Obama and Joe Biden in this country telling everybody, you guys, you just don't get what we're trying to do. I mean, if you got it, you would go along with socialism. I mean, if, I mean, if, you, I mean, if you just really understood that we're trying to help you, you would all be Marxists like we are. That's what they're getting across here. This is, this is for your benefit to mark and identify and tag your child every place that they go. And oh, by the way, we'll give them a tattoo. And oh, you know, they got their little cell phone taking pictures of what's going on in your house. And they can turn that into the proper authorities. Things are changing, folks. Things are changing right in front of our very eyes. And I think that we really need to be aware. We need to be aware, conscious of what's going on. You know, I talked about the pineal gland last week. Um, they that sleep in the night and they that sleep sleep in the night and they that be drunk are drunk in the night. And the situation is arising right now in our, in our world where people are being lulled and churches and pastors are being lulled into, into a sleep that, sad to say, more than likely they're not going to wake out of. I did a radio interview with a fellow by the name of Derek Gilbert on Harkin the Watchman um, website. Uh, a friend of mine, Chad Miles, runs that. And um, so anyway, he said, I'm amazed. I'm amazed that we have a pastor out there that knows what the singularity is. 
And it wasn't hard for me to find it out. It wasn't hard for me to figure it out. I'm not some super genius brain that monitors everything in the world. And, and I mean, it's, it's just when you start reading the Bible and start looking at what's going on, it's not hard to figure out what's happening around us. The problem is our pastors, our church people, our deacons, our, our law officials, our congressmen, we're just asleep. We don't know what's going on. We're just asleep. And uh, just, just lay down and go to sleep and everything will be okay. And then I'm telling you, it's not okay. Let's go back in time. August 2000, way back in, I mean, back in the August 2010, a couple months ago. was listening to the news and they were talking about a, a mine collapse in Chile. Okay, mine collapse. Um, you know, I don't mean to sound that cruel. It's just that, you know, stuff happens all over the world all the time. We can't always be so concerned about it. Um, but anyway, a mine collapse. And then, then, you know, a while later, they said, um, you know, there is hope now. For the 33 trapped miners in, in a deep underground pit in Chile. Uh, or Chile, I'll, I'll say it right. And um, I th was thinking, hmm, could it be? Could, could it be? So I sent a, um, a text message to my friend Chad Miles in Detroit. Runs Harkin the Watchman website. You already go there. It's a good website. Um, anyway, and I said, Chad, I think we need to watch this... Um, 33 miners thing in the pit because what was going through my mind was here we have 33 down in a pit now I'm going to if if you don't if you don't know zip about anything that goes on of a occult nature I mean that you're fine okay ignorance is bliss um, but it's okay to be aware of what is going on around us. And I'm, I'm like everybody else. I'm sitting there watching telly, um, and we're watching the, the miners come out of the pit. We are, and, and my heart, as, as a human being, as a fellow man, I am rejoicing with these men and their families um, because Christianity itself is all about saving people out of the pit of sin that they're in and bringing them uh, to, to light. That's what we're about. Through the cross of Jesus Christ. That is what we are all about. Christ was 33. When he died, he uh, descended to the lower parts of the earth. He set captivity free. He rose again on the third day. He's alive forevermore. And hallelujah, one of these days, I'm going to be alive with him. And I thank God for that. But I just knew that there was something else going on here. Those suspicions as time went on was confirmed in me and we're going to share this. I have a book here and I always keep a little, little stash of books here uh, to the side of me. This is Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. And on the front of this book we have a double-headed eagle and it has a crown on it. It says Ordo Ab Chao. Um, you need to watch our Watchman broadcast called Chaos uh, or Order Out of Chaos, and it'll explain what that means. The phrase Ordo. In fact, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but on, on the front of this is a is a triangle with a with a number on it. And that number is the number 33. That is the exact number of miners that are trapped down in the pit. Now I'm going to kind of explain uh, some of this a a as we go along here so that you can understand the symbolism of what was going on and why it was so significant. Um, Another friend of mine from Nebraska saying, Hey, Hoggy, um, I was listening to the reporters and they were using phrases such as the ascent and as if rising from a tomb and rescued from darkness to light. They're using all of these phrases that are just ringing in the ears of people literally all over the world. I mean, billions of people all over the world are watching this take place. We're listening for new, we're, wanting, we're hoping that things come out okay. And, and this has everybody's attention. And remember, this represents uh, another one of those 
paradigm shifts where everybody's attention is focused on some great event that's happening and everybody all over the world is watching this thing. Uh, you have JFK being killed and really for the first time an assassination of American president captured on film and reported all over the world and, and, and everybody is, you know, this is, everybody remembers where they were when this happened. The moon landing. Um, <clears throat> 9-11 event. Everybody remembers where they were and what they were doing on this particular day. It's jammed in our memory. It was intended to be uh, an, an awakening experience is what it was t intended to be. And so here we have what I truly believe was a ritual performed on Wednesday, October the 13th, 2010. The, the whole process of the miners being trapped and then released is a ritual of which I will explain what that means. I will use sources from the Bible. I will use sources, sources such as, uh, I don't think I have any quotes from, um, from Albert Pike, Morals and Dog, but Manley Hall, who wrote The Secret Teachings of All Ages, he has a lot to say about things like this. But you see rituals in, in, in a lot of religious settings. Wiccans and Satanists, they use rituals. They, they perform certain ceremonies um, at certain times of day with you know certain things in place and they have special things that have supposedly have magical powers and they have to do all of these things and say all of these words in order to invoke whatever power it is they're trying to tap into. Even in Roman Catholicism, and I would say in a lot and most, uh, probably all, of your orthodox-based, ritual-based Christian denominations where they say, uh, we're, we have this ritual here that we perform and we say these words and we do this thing and we do our hands like this and uh, you know the Catholic priest holds the Eucharist up toward God and he says the magic words and he does all of these things. These are all, they are prescribed rituals. If you see a Catholic Mass in one part of the world, and go to another part of the world and see a Catholic Mass, you're seeing the same thing. Because the idea is, is that rituals, when performed the right way, speaking the right words, that they will invoke the power of the deity that they're trying to invoke. In other words, the God that they serve cannot operate any other way unless you do all of these little right little things here. That doesn't happen to be the God that I believe in. The God that I believe in does not operate by way of rituals, rites, prescribed words, secret words, secret handshakes, uh, certain buildings that he'll only walk into because the God I serve doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He's not invoked by you uh, proclaiming faith-filled words like Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Myers tells you you have to, and Joel Osteen tell you, you have to say all these faith-filled words the right way in order to invoke this faith consciousness that God has and then all of a sudden you're rich. See, it worked for me. By the way, send me in $100 this week, okay? Um, no wonder it worked for them. Uh, but anyway, I don't believe in a God and I don't serve a God that has to be invoked by rituals. I don't. They will tell you that if you want your prayers answered, you must pray these faith-filled, positive confession words. And then you will create your own reality. That's, that's witchcraft. It's witchcraft is what it is. I believe in the God who David said, I cried unto the Lord and He heard me. I believe in the God whom Paul said, For we know not what to pray, but the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. I believe in the God that is simple. And the Apostle Paul told us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, think about it, through his subtlety, so your mind should, should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So in other words, he's saying that there, there is a simplicity. When you're eight years old, 
You can say, God, would you save me? And God will save you. And that's really all there is. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And even, there are even these people out there. Buddy, I'm fixing to go off. There are even these people out there that saying, well, if you're not saying Yahushua or Yeshua or Yeheshua or Yahushua HaMashiach, if you're not saying that, then you're not calling to the right God. You're praying to Zeus, the Greek god of thunder, and you are a pagan and you're going to go to hell. They've even rewritten the entire King James Bible and excluded every, every word where it says Jesus took it out, threw it in the trash, put in their, uh, their own, their own, which is not supported by any manuscript in the world, put in their own word, Yahushua. And see, they even fight amongst themselves about who's saying it right and who's not. It's witchcraft. And I said so. God is not invoked by saying His name correctly. Moses had a speech impediment. Where does that leave him? But they remove people from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they said, see, you're not saying his name right, so you're not, you're not saved. I don't like people that remove people away from the free grace of Jesus Christ and add complicated things to something that was always intended to be simple. I don't like it. Because he says in the next verse, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye received another spirit, who, which we, ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. In other words, Paul said, you, you, you won't put up with me, but if some guy comes in with another Jesus, and another gospel, and another spirit, yeah, you'll like him. You'll follow him all the way into the pits of hell is where you'll follow him. So the question is, this, this miners, he's 33, coming out of the pit. Is this a picture of Jesus or is it a picture of another Jesus? Let's, let's, look, at, let's look at what happened. Let's look at the facts and let's see what the, the conclusion that the facts draw us into. Now, I mentioned a while ago rituals. I believe that this was a ritual. I believe that 9-11 was a ritual. I believe that the JFK assassination was a ritual. These rituals, and here's the definition of the word ritual. I like to look at etymology, what, what a word really is at its root. Uh, the word right. Uh, early 14th century is where it's first used from the Latin ritus, which means religious, observance, or ceremony, custom usage. Uh, it is perhaps based upon a Greek word, arithmos, which is where we get the word arithmetic, which means to number something. Now, I want you to, I want you to get this. Because in, in almost all rituals, there is some, some, new, some amount of numerology. Okay, there's a certain amount, of, whether it's tarot cards, that's, there's numerology involved. Whether it's the Catholic Mass, there's, a, there's numerology involved. Whether it's witchcraft, there's numerology involved. Whether it's Freemasonry, with its degrees and levels and steps, those steps are numbered in, in a ritual fashion. You cannot go to a, a Freemason and say, I want to become a Freemason. And he says, well, uh, here, let me, let me sign this piece of paper, you sign it, and you're a Mason. They don't do it that way. You have to, you have to go through the, the numbers, the steps, the rites. When you achieve the rites and when you perform the rites in the right manner, then you're worthy enough to receive the illumination that comes as a result of it. I don't believe in that God. I, I don't. I don't serve that God. I serve the God that says, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. By the way, it's Jeremiah 33. 3. Okay? Here's what Manly Hall said concerning rituals, concerning the secret nature of rituals. He said, Concealed within the emblematic figures, allegories, and rituals of the ancients is a secret Doctrine. Let me stop right here. Uh, Albert Pike did say, I will uh, roughly quote from the th book 33 here, Morals and Dogma. Um, Albert Pike said in here, Masonry conceals its secrets uh, from all except the adepts and the sages. And it gives a deliberate lie concerning what those symbols mean. In other words, here we have a double-headed eagle. We have 33 stars. By the way, all the miners come out wearing this big 
Chilean star. There were 33 stars. Okay, uh, 33 stars here, and the double-headed eagle, and the crown, and the triangle, the number 33, and the rays, and order of Kale. And they say, now, if you read this book, what, what we tell you it means, it, it doesn't really mean that. It means, it means something else. We're, we're lying to you. We're going to conceal the secret. So watch this. The Jesus. Now, is it the real Jesus or another Jesus? The Jesus that is in this Bible is revealed to everyone and concealed by no man. The Jesus that he is referring to is concealed. In fact, he is the lost word. Here is the revealed word, and the, the Jesus of Masonry is the lost word. He, in fact, the Jesus of Masonry, according to Dan Brown in the lost symbol, is actually um, he's buried in a pit, and his number is 33. That's, that's, that's the lost word. That's their word. Okay. So anyway, Hall says, Concealed within, within the emblematic figures, allegories, and rituals of the ancients is a secret doctrine concerning the inner mysteries of life, which doctrine has been preserved in toto, or totally, among a small band of initiated minds since the beginning of the world. Departing, these illumined philosophers left their formula that others, too, might attain to understanding. But... Lest these secret processes fall into uncultured hands and be perverted, the great arcanum, which means the great secret, was always concealed in symbol or allegory. And those who today can, uh, those who can today discover its lost keys, may open with them a treasure house of philosophic, scientific, and religious truths. Now, I will tell you that this Bible is the key to everything. It is the absolute key of everything. And what I don't want to do in this is try to bring in all the information that I know about everything that I'm going to deal with here. We have uh, videos concerning this. Uh, one is called the Freemason Symbols Revealed: The Mother of All Secrets, Jesus Christ DNA, the Holy Bible, Triple Helix. Uh, um, the Da Vinci Code revealed uh, the Babel conspiracy. I mean, I'm just I'm bringing in the whole group here of videos that we have dealing with this. Uh, the, the the video chaos that we did back in uh, January, February, I believe. All of these tie into this one event here, and let's look at the symbolism of this event. When it comes to rituals itself, rituals uh, basically are, uh, remember, we, we're dealing with two gods here. We're dealing with a God who doesn't need rituals in order to do what he wants to do for you to begin with. And then we have the God over here that says that everything that you do has to be done perfectly or I won't show up. I've described these gods as beasts, being like beasts in nature. Dogs have a nature about them that there are certain places they're comfortable with, certain places they're not. Moles. Moles have a nature. There are certain places they're comfortable with, certain they're not. Horses and lions and giraffes and iguanas have certain places and certain things that they'll do if the conditions are right and certain that they're not. Um, we're heading into deer season here in Missouri and deer season is designed in the state of Missouri around the mating season of deer. And we all know in Missouri that if it doesn't get cold enough in this state, when deer season comes around, you can forget it because they're not going to go in rut. They're not going to go in their mating season. So these, these gods are beasts. And certain conditions have to apply. Aleister Crowley, the famed occultist from the late eight, uh, 1800s, early 1900s, designed and built this house called the Bullskin House. And it was designed in a particular manner so that he could summon this demon that he called Lamb, you know, this big gray-headed alien Lamb guy. And he had to, had to build it in a certain way and in a certain fashion or this demon would never show up. Um, Eliphas Levi. Uh, summoned this demon that, I mean, he just looks a lot like Yoda here from Star Wars. And notice, I mean, he's got these candles lit. He's got these things drawn on the ground. He's saying the right words. He's holding his hands up in the air. All of these things have to be done in a very prescribed, perfect manner. Or the summoning of the devil or the God just will not happen. And that is the nature 
of doing these rituals and these rites and anybody and I don't care what church it is they're telling you now we're, we have this we have this little thing that we do then if you do this I've seen deliverance ministries perform rituals on people as if the ritual is going to exercise the demons or do whatever people don't fall for that trap and that's exactly what it is it's a trap uh, we mentioned 9-11 earlier the Pentagon ritual, the Great Rite ritual, which plays into this whole minor, Chilean minor ritual. The Great Rite ritual, the male symbol of an airplane or a missile or whatever it is you want, uh, going into the pentagon or the pentagram structure which is the image of a woman who is sprawled out and the great rite ritual has everything to do with the male and the female the sons of God and the daughters of men coming together. We saw earlier that that ritual up on a billboard here the angelic man touching the earth woman and they are connecting together that's what all of this iconography and this imagery is all about. It's about Performing these things in the right manner so that you can invoke the power of the God. So the first thing that we deal with here is we have the number of minors. We have 33. Now I'm going to read some things that kind of put some things together in your mind for you so you see how this number was repeated um, throughout this whole ritual, throughout this whole ceremony. Uh, they were in a pit, they were in a chamber, and they were brought, and it's very dark down there, and they were brought from darkness to light. That happens to be one of the main themes of Freemasonry and practically all occult religions uh, is that they're being brought from dark darkness into light. So you get that idea of 33 being brought from darkness to light. 33 is a number associated with the Antichrist. We have 33 minors. The date of the mind collapse was 8510, which equals 23. That's the number of chromosome pairs in your cell. They drilled for 33 days. They reached the pit on day 66. The number of books in the Bible, or 33 times 2. They ascended out of the pit on the 69th day, which is 23 times 3. They were rescued and, and, and let me say this. You know, remember I, earlier, and, I, and I, I, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a predictor. I'm, not, I'm a lousy weatherman. This is, this is actually the first time I've been right about something. But Sunday, uh, what was that, 10, 10, 10? Uh, I sent word to Chad up in Detroit and I said, Chad, the miners are going to be released out of that pit on Wednesday, 10 13, 2010. And so we're watching. We're watching. And at exactly 12 11 Chilean time, 12 11 is 23. On exactly 12, at 12 11 a.m. Chilean time, on Wednesday, October the 13th, 2010, the first miner came up. And then subsequently, they said, man, it's going to take us a day and a half to get these guys out. It was all done in less than 20 hours. 22 hours, precisely. 22 is the number for revelation. I want you to think about that. 22 hours, and they were all taken out on the exact same day. 10, 13, plus 10 equals 33. And even the very capsule that they were taken out in reveals something. Here's that logo here. Is a close-up of it. Ordo ab KO, uh, the number 33, the crown. These are all references to the Antichrist. Um, here's a close-up view of it, of a different sort here. We have the number 33, 33 rays coming out of there. This has everything to do with someone who is a king. Uh, the rites of Freemasonry, of the Scottish rite of Freemasonry, equal 33. Now, there's 13 in the York rite, and uh, we'll discern something that goes along with that here in just a little bit. But let me just throw this in to you as sort of, uh, did you know this? And I was sharing this with a guy the other day, and he's going, no way. And I said, way. Um, Pope John Paul I, remember him? He was Pope after Pope Paul. He came in, and to be Pope, he found out that there, 
of all things, there was a deep, dark, secret mystery religion operating inside of another deep, dark, secret mystery religion. Uh, he found out that there were Freemasons in the Vatican and they were actually going to control everything that was going on. And there was a ritual that took place in 1963 uh, called the, uh, the ritual, the enthronement ceremony of the fallen angel Lucifer. He found out about all these things and was going to kick some people out of the Vatican for that and for some banking things that were going on. And they found him dead. 33 days after he became Pope. Do you remember Timothy McVeigh? You know, the Oklahoma City bomber, or one of them. The Alfred P. Murrow building. By the way, Alfred P. Murrow was a 33rd degree Mason. By the way, the Alfred P. Murrow building, I'm getting ahead of myself here, stood for 33 days after it was bombed and then they tore it down. Timothy McVeigh, they waited until at, they waited until 23 days after his 33rd birthday to execute him. David Koresh, Waco, Highway 77, he was 33 years old. Mohammed Atta, the pilot of Flight 11, September 11, 2001. Guess how old he was? He was 33 years old. The World Trade Towers, 1968, they began steel construction on the frame. 33 years later, they came down. The Alfred P. Murrow building, Milk mentioned it a while ago, named after a 33rd degree Mason. Okay, So, I mean, I'm telling you, symbols abound. Um, JFK, he was 46 years old, number of chromosomes. Okay, 33rd parallel, Dallas, at the end of an obelisk street structure in Dallas, Texas, Dealey Plaza, the site of a former Masonic lodge in Dallas, Texas, gunned down. You have Babylon, Iraq on the 33rd parallel. You have a city called Phoenix, Arizona on the 33rd parallel. The first atomic weapon ever used, tested at the Alamogordo site, New Mexico, 33rd parallel. The last one ever used uh, on a city in time of war was Nagasaki, Japan on the 33rd parallel. Now, remember, we have two Jesuses. We have one Jesus who died when he was 33 years old. We have another one, a beast rising up out of the pit. The phrase, the beast, is mentioned exactly 33 times in the New Testament of my old King James Bible right here. Okay, So which, which Jesus is this one talking about? We're, we're going to get more clues here. By the way, let me, let me deal with this Jesus thing for a minute. Why, why was Jesus 33? What was the significance of it? Because the Bible says in Colossians that Jesus made a show of his enemies openly, triumphing over them in the cross. In other words, when Jesus was on the cross, everything about him was symbolic. Those symbol, symbols are revealed in the pages of the scriptures always. They're not concealed. They're revealed in the Bible. He was 33 because he was conquering the power of death. He was conquering the Antichrist. We have the enemies of Israel. When Moses and Joshua went in, Moses killed two of the kings. Joshua killed 31 of them. That's 33. These were 33 kings that were ruling over the promised land and had to be destroyed so that God's people could go in. That's what Jesus was dying. His death was all about. The, the defeat of his enemies. The defeat of the beast in the last days. That's what he was showing when he was nailed to the cross. Jesus said as the serpent, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the serpent is the enemy of Christ. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Why? Was Jesus the devil? No. But he was showing the defeat of the serpent. By the way, the serpent, Kundalini, 33 bones. He was showing the defeat of the serpent on the cross. He defeated, he was showing the defeat of his enemies when he was 33 years old. The 33 being referred to by Pike and Manley Hall and Dan Brown is none other than the beast. <clears throat> and where is the beast? Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not <clears throat> and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So here we have 33 miners trapped in a pit. They ascended on 10-13-10, which equals 33. This Masonic rituals include the death and the resurrection of Hiram Abiff. By the way, the name Hiram 
comes from the scriptures. In the King James Bible, Hiram or Hulam is mentioned exactly 33 times in the King James Bible. The Masonic symbol of a coffin. Remember the news people were saying, oh, they're coming up, uh, they're like in a tomb. The Masonic symbol of a coffin shows that the beast that was and is not, he is in the pit, he's buried in a tomb right now. And he's awaiting his ascension out of the pit, his resurrection. 66 days of drilling. Remember from Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol, we find out that beneath the uh, Washington Monument, that obelisk there, symbol of the Antichrist, beneath that is the cornerstone of the Washington's Monument, and inside of it is a Masonic Bible, 66 books. It's a symbol of the lost word of Freemasonry, the anti-Bible, if you were, uh, concealed within a pit, and the whole symbolism, Dan Brown showed this in the lost symbol, is that when you rise up to the top of the Washington's Monument, you're going up a set of spiral stairs, just like Kundalini, you're going up 33 floors or 33 stories to the top of the obelisk, the ascension. Folks, the symbolism is all there. The date of entrapment, 81510, which makes a 23. They were released after 69 days, which is 23 times 3. The two of the main symbols of Freemasonry is the symbols of Jacob and Boaz, the two pillars in the temple, which is a picture of the human body. Those Jacob and Boaz were both 23 cubits tall. That number 23, or 40, and when you have two pillars, 23 cubits tall, that's 46. And notice again, the 33 steps of Scottish Rite Masonry, the 13 steps of York Rite Masonry, make 46, the number of chromosomes where our DNA is stored. In the Masonic House of the Lodge Temple in Washington, D.C., you have a Greek temple and a step pyramid. The Greek temple represent, has 33 pillars on it. And the step pyramid has 13 steps. That's 46. When you go inside, I've been there, I counted this, you go inside the, the house of the Lodge Temple, you walk up these spiral staircases like DNA, there's 23 steps on one side, 23 steps on the other, that's 46, because literally it is about the temple of man and where the, where the beast is going to be in the temple of God. In the Old Testament, the wilderness tabernacle was designed, you're going to like this, 20 boards on the north, 20 boards on the south, 6 boards across the back. That's 46 boards that make the wilderness tabernacle where the book of the law, the DNA, was stored. The DNA is stored in 46 chromosomes inside the most holy place of your cell. The people, the symbolism is there. Remember a few weeks ago, we dealt with the Lincoln Memorial. 36 columns on the outside, 10 hidden columns on the inside, 46. And we have the emblem here of a God inside of a temple. What is this referring? referring to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin 33 3 is the number for sin lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life that man of sin be revealed the number 22 is the number for revelation the book of revelation has 22 chapters in it by the way and how many hours did it take? 22 hours to reveal this to mankind. The son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth where? In the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. A ritual was performed. Now, is this the real Jesus or the fake one? Now let me let me show you this, and and we're gonna I'm gonna show you some things that will shed light on this. On the front of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, it, it, there's a double-headed eagle. Now Manley Hall is going to tell you that this eagle is really not an eagle. What is it? It's a mythological bird. Hmm. It's called the phoenix. 
as I told my friend up in Detroit, I said, I think we need to watch these 33 miners trapped in a pit. We need to find out when they're going to ascend. It wasn't uh, too long after that that we finally heard that they had a plan to remove the 33 out of the pit. The plan was to have this escape pod specially built for this and it was called the Phoenix. And when I heard that I went, now I know. Now I know what's going on. Let's understand what the Phoenix is. In fact, let me uh, before we do that, let's let's look at the symbolism here of this. I want you to get this and I'm going to describe this in very uh, G-rated terms. Remember, we talked about the fusion of the opposites, the sons of God mating and joining in with the daughters of men, the great rite ritual that was performed September 11th, 2001 at the Pentagram building where the male enters into the female. So I want you to look at this because we're looking at the symbol of conception and rebirth. Conception and rebirth. So we have the male entering into the female. It's similar to the blade and the chalice of the, the Knights Templar, the blade and chalice of the Great Rite Ritual. The, the phoenix tube entering into the, the, the female, which is the earth, the male entering into the female. We have the conception and the, we have the... So we have the tube going in and then we have it, the phoenix being brought back out bringing the 33 miners. That's the imagery that we get here. By the way, this tube was designed to be exactly 13 feet long. Remember the 13-step pyramid on top of the Masonic building. Also, the... 13 rows of stones on the unfinished pyramid and it says Anuit Coeptus which means he favors the birth the conception and the birth of a Novus Ordo Seclorum a new world order by the way 13 Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Thirteen word title in your King James Bible so we know what we're dealing with here the symbolism of the phoenix is that the phoenix, mythological bird, a bird, a birds in the Bible are pictures of angels, things with wings, a fallen angel. Nine, Revelation chapter 9 verse 11, the king who is the king of the bottomless pit. He's an angel. He is the king of the bottomless pit. The phoenix is a bird that dies in a flame and is resurrected out of its own ashes. Manly P. Hall said concerning the phoenix, and there's a, several quotes here. Um, he says, Out of the cold ashes of lifeless creeds, however, shall rise phoenix-like the ancient mysteries. The dying God shall live. It's what he said. So the phoenix in itself is a picture of the God who was died, the beast that was and is not and yet shall be. The phoenix is an emblem of the Antichrist who is in the pit, dead, in a tomb, buried, and he's going to live again by ascending up. Uh, Manley Hall also said in the mysteries it was customary to refer to initiates as phoenixes or men who had been born again. For just as physical birth gives man consciousness in the physical world, so the neophyte, after nine degrees in the womb of the mysteries, was born into a consciousness of the spiritual world. This is the mystery of initiation to which Christ referred when he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice that's John 3.3. 3. The phoenix is a fitting symbol of this spiritual truth. He goes on to say, The Egyptians occasionally represented the phoenix as having the body of a man and the wings of a bird. That is an, that's an angel creature. This biform creature had a tuft of feathers upon its head and its arms were upraised in an attitude of prayer. As the phoenix was the symbol of regeneration, the tuft of feathers on the back of its head might well symbolize the activity of the pineal gland or the third eye. Folks, it's, it's all there. 
the serpent rising up the 33 bones of your spine, activating your pineal gland, your third eye, illumination. That's what that was referring to. This symbolism of what took place uh, on Wednesday, uh, October the 13th, 2010, was intended to be an awakening to people. It was intended to be a subliminal ideology given to people all over the world that the phoenix... Number 33 is soon to be rising. And what, what, I don't know of anybody that said, oh, these guys ought to die. We need to keep them in. I don't know of anybody that said that. Everybody said, we need, we, these people need to rise up. The 33 need to come up out into the light. That was the imagery being planted. The ritual performed to empower the gods to do what they have planned to do in this world. Manley Hall goes on to say, Masonry will be in a position to solve many of the secrets of its esoteric doctrine when it realizes that both its single and double-headed eagles are phoenixes, and that to all initiates and philosophers, the phoenix is the symbol of the transmutation and regeneration of the creative energy, commonly called the accomplishment of the great work. The double-headed phoenix is the prototype of an androgynous man. So Albert Pike here is saying that the phoenix, his birth and death and resurrection is a symbol of the man who is both God and beast. Male, andro, gynus, female, androgynous, male and female together. The phoenix, the double-headed, in fact even Albert Pike says the two heads of the eagle represent the male and the female fused together in the same body. When you see the phoenix, you see Baphomet. The God who is both male and female. That's not Jesus. That is the beast rising up in the last days. Notice this, Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God doth know, this is what the serpent spoke to Eve. This is of the 46 words, remember the chromosomes? Of the 46 words that the devil, the serpent, spoke to Eve. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It just so happens that the 33rd word spoke to Eve was eyes, the pineal gland, the third eye. A ritual was performed. Not only a ritual to invoke the power of the spirit of Antichrist that John said is already at work in the earth right now, and I believe that, but a ritual that was designed to illuminate the minds of mankind all over the world so that we see the phoenix rising. And I'll tell you, the phoenix is not a Christian symbol. It is a symbol of the Antichrist rising up in the last days. This was done right in front of our very eyes. How many things going on around us do we see? Advertisements, movies. People sending me movies. Pastor Mike, I saw this in a movie. And, and, or i tell you what really impresses me. Pastor Mike, my son was watching television or they were watching a movie and they said, Mommy, come and look at this. Isn't this doesn't this talk about the, the Antichrist or the devil? i tell you what, I tell you what I'm thankful for. I'll tell you that I'm thankful that the devil did not open my eyes. That God... I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I see according to this Bible right here, the truthfulness of what's going on. I'm glad that we have an opportunity right now in this world to expose things. Now, let me, let me say this, and I said it earlier. Am I glad that miners are out of there? Boy, you bet. If that was my family, if that was me down there, man, I'd want out of there. So we're glad. We're thankful. We hope, we hope that they all trust Jesus with all of their heart. Well, that's what we hope. But I will tell you the symbolism behind it, the ritual behind it. And, it, and if you think, oh, come on, men didn't orchestrate this. What they do? Blow that up? No. Because the true nature of any conspiracy is that spirits are involved. Spirits. And I believe there are powerful forces 
that were in control of every aspect of this situation. So much so that those who are versed in the language of symbolism, when these things go on, we go, we, we know what that is. We know what's going on. Several of you, several of you is writing me saying, Pastor Mike, uh, 33 minors, uh, does that mean something? You, you knew in your heart what was going on. And folks, we're being taken in degrees and steps. The assassination of a president, the landing on the moon, the destroying of a building, um, uh, you know, 9-11, um, the Columbia space shuttle. By the way, okay, it broke up on the 33rd, between the 32nd and 33rd day of the year. Broke up, the pieces fell over Fort Worth, Texas, 33rd parallel, and it was on its way to landing at runway 33 at Kennedy Space Center. Okay? Uh, these things are rituals performed right in front of our very eyes, designed to bring mankind to a new awareness and a new level. And think of how think of how grand this orchestration was. And yet, think of how simple it is to just say, "God, I want to be saved, and I want you to open my eyes to what's in this book." Boom. It's done. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. He didn't say, now perform the right ritual. Invoke me. Say the magic words. It's not the God I believe in. The God I believe in is simple. The God that I want to lead you to is profoundly simple. Choose Jesus Christ and choose this Bible. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you on the next Watchman Pure Bible Study. Bye-bye.